All right. Thank you for joining us, everyone, today on Making the Argument. Today we have the full team. We have Tina, we have Christian, we have Nick, still in Richmond, and we also have Hamilton. I, of course, Sarah Padgelids, am also here. I won't say I'm excited about today's topic like I usually am, but it's a very important topic, and I'm really interested to see what everybody has to say. Today we're going to be talking about medically assisted dying, uh, more commonly known as assisted suicide. It's been getting big in Canada. There was most recently a Japanese uh, professor from Yale who was talking about how to make it work in Japan. Um, So I am looking forward to this conversation. It won't be as uplifting as some of our talks are, but I think we'll come to some really good conclusions. So Hamilton, if you want to get us started. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us on this episode. If you would like to chat with us about this topic, we would be interested to hear what you have to say and what you think about it. You can do so by going to the description of this podcast on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or Spotify and click that link to join our community chat on Volley. We'd love to meet you there and have a conversation about this with you. And of course, Nick is also here with us from Richmond. Nick, what have you been up to over there? Oh my gosh. How do people in DC do this full time? I'm sorry. It's not that I don't listen. Let me just clarify something. I think, I think it's a a privilege to serve in the Virginia house of delegates. It's certainly a privilege to serve in James Madison's district, but the idea of just being a full time legislator is I am so glad we have a citizen legislature in Virginia. Um, We got this week, we got next week and the next week we should be done. And, and, you know, done for the year uh, down here in Richmond. Hopefully there'll be no special sessions or anything like that. But it, it has been it has been some interesting times. Basically, I, I had about seven bills get out of the House of Delegates. All of them ended up dying in the Senate, as, as you can imagine. There's, uh, you know, obviously two different two different types of uh, parties in control down here. And that's what ends up happening. But we, we did have some interesting fireworks. I'll tell one little story here because I think it's kind of interesting. We have uh, Senator Louise Lucas. She's the Senate pro tempore. Um, Big time. Like to give you an idea, she likes to go on Twitter before she's even heard the bills in her committee. And she held up like a trash can um, and said, here's what's going to happen to all of these, you know, anti choice bills and stuff like that, where it was just kind of this childish demonstration. And then we actually get bills in front of um, House, Senate and Ed, and, and she ends up killing a bunch of Republican bills without any testimony. She goes, well, these are similar to either Senate bills we already killed or, um, and, you know, and, and typically what happens is we're a deliberative body. So if, if we, you know, we hear a bill in the House and we, and we kill it and then a Senate bill comes over that's the identical or similar, we still allow the patron to speak to it, not because we think they're going to change our mind, but because you never know. There could be new testimony. There could be a substitute they want to offer. They might have looked at what happened in the House and decided, oh, you know what? If I just change this about this bill, maybe it'll give it a better chance. So we afford them that opportunity. Well, she did none of that. And that is way outside the normal scope and practice of the way we do business down here. Well, I didn't think this was appropriate, so I got to my subcommittee. And it just so happened that Tina and our youngest daughter, Allie, were down for the day. So they got to see me uh, run my subcommittee. Well, I took up four uh, Democrat bills that were similar, identical to House bills that we already heard. And I said, you know, apparently this is the new rule in the Senate. I said, and, and it's unfortunate because it's not the way we're supposed to do business. But if you're going to do business this way, I don't know how to do anything else other than reciprocate. So you understand this isn't appropriate. I said, so for the next fall, the, these four bills, we will not hear for the patron. And then I did my motion. And the committee voted each one down and they got furious and it went all over Twitter and, and everything else. I said, look, this is really simple. You guys go back to the way we have always done business and, and I will be happy to reciprocate. But I'm not going to sit here and let you kill all of our bills and say, oh, you know what? We're going to rise above. No, I'm not. I'm not going to rise above because you need to feel you, you need to feel the consequences of your actions so that you can change course and go back to doing this the right way. Well, it, it actually did end up having some effect and, and we kind of got into normal order of business. And so, and that was good. That was appropriate. But, you know, it just goes to show that this attitude sometimes that we're just supposed to sit there and take it, um, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Um, not, not in this context, right? So anyways, interesting story, but I, all that to say, uh, it's been an interesting session, but we're, we're definitely ready to, <laughs> ready to get back to, uh, to Culpepper. And, and I'm interested in this topic, too, because we've also been debating about the life issue. Lately, we had something of a um, <laughs> we had some of a bit of a floor debate today on, on the life issue. And I, I think it's relevant because all of these issues stem from the same thing. And, and that is what do we as a society believe about human life? Is it sacred? Is it 
Um, are we creating the image of God? Do we believe in a society which actually has some reverence for human life and therefore human rights? Or are, are we just simply, you know, born out of, you know, <laughs> tooth and claw and we're all just cosmic accidents and, and we're going to go ahead and, and adopt a, a certain moral philosophy which reflects that? Um, and I think these questions are being reflected and some of the answers that are coming forward are a little bit terrifying, but it does show us where the direction of the conversation is going. And if you're not prepared for it, you're going to find yourself in a lot of situations where people bring up topics and you're going to say, oh, that's ridiculous. And they're going to say, why do you think that? And you're not going to have an answer because it never occurred to us to have an answer for some of these topics. So anyways, let's let's get to it. Yeah. So I think that's a really gr- great place to kick this off because that's exactly what I was thinking when this first came uh, to my attention back in October of last year. So I started noticing that Canada was taking this in a really dark direction. And I said, mark my words, this is because we don't respect human life. Now, anybody who knows anything about me knows that despite not being uh, Christian, fully Christian, I was raised in that in the church, but I don't consider myself a Christian. I am 100% pro-life. Uh, I feel very, very strongly about abortion. I feel very, very strongly about this exact same issue. So when Tina sent us this article about the Yale professor suggesting mass suicide to suggest Japan's to solve solving, uh, excuse me, to solve Japan's aging population, I was like, wow, this is really like kind of an edgy way to get attention on this topic. And I kind of view it as a good thing because we do need people to start paying attention because like Nick was saying, people are going to bring this up and you're going to have no counter for it. And I really want our audience to be fully prepared because this is looking like it's going to become more and more pressing for people to be able to address it and to be able to explain why they think it's wrong. Now, it just seems like a horrible idea at the outset to me, but that's how they get these ideas in is they gently, slowly kind of introduce them in the uh, most harmless way you can imagine. Like, oh, you know, these are people at the end of life. They, really they introduce it as a really solution to the pain. problem, right? As right, a solution exactly. to the problem. They do introduce it as a, right? They're like, we're being compassionate. We want to help solve people's issues. And this is how we're going to do it. And from there, they can just expand. Now, Nick, you mentioned that somebody, was kind of pitching this as an idea in Virginia. Is that correct? What was the thinking there? Well, we I've had people ask me before if I'd be willing to carry legislation on assisted suicide. And their reasoning behind that is like, okay, Nick's a liberty guy. You know, he believes that people should be able to you know, be in control of their own lives. And so maybe he would support this. And I think they were a little bit surprised to find out I do not. <laughs> and, and the issue that I brought up to them was, look, if, if someone is going to commit suicide, uh, they, they clearly can do that. And, and they would be beyond any consequences if they choose to make that decision, at least any earthly consequences. Uh, but the idea that we would put ourselves in a situation um, to not only potentially encourage this, but commercialize it, I think has really bad second and third order effects. I, I think once you get into, and, and Tina has actually brought this point up very eloquently, it's the whole idea that once you, once you allow something to be a, a profit-making endeavor, Right, which is nothing wrong with making a profit. It depends on what are you making a profit on, and once you make it a profit, a profit um, making endeavor, now you're actually encouraging advertising toward that direction. You're encouraging people to actually, um, you know, entice you uh, to make certain decisions. And we we can say all day long that, well, you know, people should be able to do what they want. Okay, great, fine, but do you really want to create a situation and an atmosphere where you now have an industry? Uh, that that is working toward that end that that is encouraging it and i just i just think that's so destructive yeah i think so as well and i i i really would like to kind of hopefully over the course of this episode give people a framework for how to respond to this idea and i know that a lot of the people in our audience hold very strongly very highly above all other values the idea of liberty freedom to do what you want. And it's kind of a hard sell to tell people that, no, you actually shouldn't just be able to end your life whenever you want. Um, And I think that we kind of need to unpack that idea because it is relatively nuanced. It's actually not open and shut to say you don't have, or you shouldn't have, you shouldn't feel that you have complete control over when your life ends. You certainly didn't have any say in when it began or how you were born, but you also have a very limited um, response or freedom 
to end your own life. So if you guys want to weigh in on that, what is the best way to argue against this to a libertarian or someone who values freedom above all else? Well, I mean, I think for me, you know, when we, when we talk about, when you talk about freedom or you talk about liberty and, and you're talking about these things as if they are a moral good, like an inherent moral good in and of itself. I think it's also important to ask it, okay, why do you believe that? Like, what, what is the moral foundation for that premise? Because that's not an a priori, you know, statement. It's, oh, freedom is good. Why? Well, because I like it. Okay, well, that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't mean it's an objective moral good. It just means you happen to prefer it toward the alternative. Well, for, for me, liberty or freedom is not just good because I happen to like or prefer it. I think it is good in the sense that the God that created us created us free to be able to make certain decisions, which are important, um, not only for the purposes of, of things like, um, you know, individual ownership or autonomy, but freedom is, is the environment where you get to express things like love because you have to be free to love if that makes sense. You, you have to be in a situation where you can't be forced to love. And so on, a, on an intellectual and an emotional statement, that's why I believe freedom is good, but it only makes sense to me inside that larger content of, you know, the created order that, that God has set up and as part of my Christian faith. That provides the intellectual consistency across the board for me to posit this idea that, yes, you know, you, you have inherent value because, right, and you should be free because. Uh, now, once you have that liberty, though, what you do with it, it can be, you know, good and productive, or it could be heavily immoral. And whereas I might not be in favor of the government trying to come in and step in and and constantly define what you can or cannot do, especially if you're not hurting someone else, that doesn't mean that I agree with everybody's individual actions. It, it doesn't like if, if you, yes, you may be free to sit on your couch and smoke pot every day of your life until the day you die without doing anything other than making enough money to, to you know, feed your, your, your habits or what you want to do. That doesn't mean that's good. I don't look at that as, oh, that's, that's a moral positive because, hey, liberty. So I think it's important that when we look at all these situations and we're talking about the question of life, it is perfectly relevant and reasonable for someone like me to say, well, yes, because of this worldview, which holds up humanity as creating in the image of God and having value. Uh, whereas, you know, I'm not necessarily going to come in and you know, prevent you from doing a lot of things that I disagree with. And I'm certainly not going to force you to believe what I believe. But by the same token, absolutely not. Will, will I ever vote for legislation that potentially creates this commercial apparatus where we're going to allow people to, you know, go to a business um, in, in order to have, in, in, in order to die? Um, because Nick, can the I... implications of that, because the implications of that go way beyond that individual decision right there in a way that I think is very, very destructive. And so I'm not going to lend my support to something like that. The, the money side of this is something that I think a lot of people are missing. Um, a, a good example is actually um, Wilberforce's fight against slavery in um, the UK in the early 19th century. Um, William Wil Wilberforce was a member of, of the um, UK Parliament at the time when the slave trade was a major component of the British economy. There weren't any slaves in Britain itself, but there were many spread across Britain's many colonies. And there were quite a few people that got substantially wealthy going to West Africa, purchasing slaves from native West African kingdoms, and then shipping them across the Atlantic to places like Jamaica or Barbados or Belize or before the American Revolution, what became the, the United States. Obviously, when the British lost that, they didn't have the ability to do, to do that anymore. But, um, but until 1809, the slave trade was also legal in the United States. So there was a period where the British were still shipping slaves into the U.S. Um, and Wilberforce was an abolitionist. Um, he thought that slavery was immoral. He thought it was it was it was one of the most evil things that existed, and he was uh, very upset that it was enshrined in the legal code. It wasn't like an, an act of immorality that people were doing, like murder, right? That would always still be illegal, but in this case, slavery was something that was being sanctioned by the state itself, as saying this isn't just we're letting you do this. This is we're condoning this, and so Wilber Wilberforce repeatedly tried to abolish slavery, and he. He constantly found pushback, and then eventually, after repeated attempts and failures to actually make any progress on this, he realized that the reason that any time that he would propose any sort of bill to curtail slavery, it was getting shot down because there were so many groups that had a vested financial interest in protecting the slave trade. 
the money was was perpetuating the institution at that point. And so then he he decided to have a a strategy shift where he decided, okay, I'm I'm unfortunately I obviously I can't make this argument as much as I want to. I can't just make the moral argument for it because whenever I do it gets shot down. So I'm going to go after the money. And so he instead pushed towards abolishing the slave trade rather than abolishing slavery itself. Because anytime that he tried to fight against slavery itself, he would lose because there were too many people that, that were making too much money. So one by one, he chipped away at the the sectors of the economy that could financially profit from slavery. And what he found was is that with each passing year, there were less and less industry groups out there that would show up in parliament and fight back against his bill because they no longer were able to profit from slavery anyway. So suddenly there was no incentive for large numbers of people to defend it. And eventually he managed to chip away at it so much. He shut off that that funding of money that there was no, I mean, tongue in cheek, tongue in cheek there was no slavery industrial complex that could oppose him. And right before he died, um, uh, they managed to do a whip count. They they were right about to actually take the the vote to abolish slavery and. Um, and he was on his deathbed by this point and, and because he had been fighting this for, for literally decades. Um, and they were able to tell him literally in like the last two or three days of his life that they had guaranteed that the votes were, were there to abolish slavery. And a few days after he died, they actually voted for the bill successfully to get rid of it. And um, Wilberforce is not really super well known in the U.S. because his story is, you know, across the pond from us. But a very similar thing, I am very concerned on the – assisted suicide aspect of this, that you're going to have the same thing, that you're going to have an assisted suicide industry, that now with the explosion of depression in the U.S., and I actually, there's an article that I just found that literally was just published today from uh, from MSN that's talking about um, this, this um, depression epidemic within the generation that's younger than Hamilton and I, Zoomers, especially those that are like in, still in high school, and especially girls. Apparently, 50% of all girls in of, of a high school age have contemplated suicide. Um, and, uh, quote, the, the ones that, that feel that they have persistent feelings of sadness and hopeless um, hopelessness has increased from 2011 when I was in high school. It was 36%, which is still astronomically high, to 57% today. And so imagine if you now have an entire industry that financially benefits from going to a depressed person and offering suicide as an option. What are they going to well, be doing? And, They're going to be creating more customers by encouraging yeah. depression and we rather than trying that, to fight against it. We already know that people with mental illness are very impressionable, especially from family, friends, and the medical community. And if you're an adult, if you're 18, you're an adult, right? You, uh, according to, uh, well, apparently not because you can't buy tobacco, you can't, you can't drink, and you can't own a gun <laughs> now. But you can be shipped off to war and vote. So apparently, the government says you're still yeah. an adult. Um, so, so imagine an 18 year old girl who just graduated high school, or maybe is still in high school, that is now legally an adult that is suffering from depression. Like we've seen this explosion of young women that are suffering with depression right now. We're also seeing an explosion of young men as well, but it's particularly affecting young women right now, more so than when I was in high school 10 years ago. Now you're 18, and now you have an entire industry out there that is killing people, making money, killing people who have depression. That industry is now going to do everything in its power to encourage more depression because they want to increase their customer pool. Well, well, you know, based on the way that they let's, did, let's, hold on, let's not even... based on the way that they did marijuana laws, like here in Virginia, right? I wonder if they would give murderers like first right um, to open their little suicide <laughs> shop, just like they did with drug dealers think, here. You know, honestly, well, there is like a ton of money involved in this, just like there wasn't a big transgender, you know, thing pushing people to change their gender until it was a billion dollar industry. And then there wasn't a massive problem with, you know, unwanted pregnancy and abortion until there was a billion dollar industry. It kind of reminds me of the situation when they had the problem with snakes. Uh, what country was that? In oh, India. In British India. India. And yeah. they, they yeah. were like, oh, you know, we want to eradicate these snakes. So we'll pay you for every dead snake you bring in. Turns out then you've got people breeding snakes in order to bring it in and get money. And so that's kind of what well, they're doing here. Take this 
only sometimes effective birth control so we can abort your baby or here be more depressed so we can just kill you. And then in other countries like uh, in uh, the Netherlands, they're now using euthanasia and assisted suicide for parents who want to off their kids. Well, I want to make one quick point here. What concern does someone have over their financial situation who would like to end their life? They, they don't care how much money they leave in the bank. Could it be that these practices of assisted suicide could get very expensive? Oh, very predatory, maybe? Yeah. And yeah. also, I just want to put one thing out there. I don't think anybody has the right to put on someone else's shoulders their own death. So I don't have the right to tell someone else they have to kill me as a medical concern. That's that. Well, there's no okay, right so to that. You can't force someone else so, to kill you. Well, no, you're not. That's the thing. You're not forcing them to do it, right? They'll get paid to do it. Yeah, but, but the point but, is, so real quick, real quick, let's back this up a second, right? Because it, it's it's easy for us to come up with all like the most extreme examples of how this, but that is not how this is going to go. Right. We've already seen how this goes. It, it starts off with people that are, are suffering from terminal diseases, oftentimes very right. painful. Um, it, it, you know, now in the Netherlands and other places are talking about children with terminal diseases and palliative care. That's one of the things that gets talked about a lot. Um, it, it's going to be other situations. And so that's what it's really going to focus on right now. It's going to be within these these very specific, very limited categories. But to to the point that Christian was making earlier too is that you're we're now talking about situations where people as adults will be able to make these decisions, and it'll probably start off with some sort of like physician's note or counseling requirements or whatnot. But just like we see within transgender surgeries, they just find the counselor that will give them the result they want in order to perform the operations or or medicate the way that they they want to already. So, so the problem is, is that, yes, the, the moment you make it a money-making endeavor, you're actually going to incentivize people to encourage this sort of behavior. Now, one of the things that people will respond to that on is they'll say, well, that's ridiculous because if it got too expensive or it got you can just do it yourself. Okay, that's, that's true, all right? But understand now, if, if you actually have a counseling apparatus um, that is, is, it is incentivized to encourage you to make a particular decision and to do it, you know, a, a, a dignified way with this particular company that, oh, by the way, is covered by Medicaid, right? And then, so the, the, interest is, the interesting thing here is it's not just about the situation where somebody is in pain or somebody is depressed. The, the question is, is an overall culture which believes that, that people and, and that overpopulation or too many people or too many of the wrong sort of people by their definitions are the problem. And the solution to that is to get rid of those people. And, and we see this argument made all the time within the, the abortion environment. Oh, that child is going to grow up in a difficult home. They could potentially be abused. They'll be impoverished. What kind of life is that? It's like, well, or, or better question, who are you to make that decision for them? And, and I, I always, whenever I see this too, with uh, I've seen people come back and say, well, my mother had me and I wish she had it. Like, I'm sorry, but the way I know that isn't true is you're still here. Right. And, and, and I don't mean that I don't mean that to be flippant. I just mean it to be an obvious contradiction between your statements and your actions. It's because somewhere inside of you, you still hold out hope that it could be better. Hmm. And, and that is a good instinct. That is something that we should be fostering and encouraging people, not this idea that when it's when it's difficult, that checking out or that the world is a better place without you or that you're better off without being here. There, there's, I think, so many perverse incentives associated with that, that it would vastly outweigh any potential benefit that, that people could attempt to articulate or envision. Can I bring up one point real quick? There's, there's um, an interesting correlation between how far along a country is down this euthanasia road um, with what type of medical system they have. So if it's a government run medical system, the government has a vested interest to make sure that you're not sitting there draining off the medical money, you know, and a getting a lot point. of care. And so governments, I've seen um, case after case of Canada, in, in Canada, people who um, keep on coming up with like, look, hey, I just need to, I need a new 
you know, wheelchair apparatus to help me get up these stairs and my mobility is really difficult. Have you considered and, just killing yourself and instead? Th- <laughs> and literally, that is exactly what they do. Have you considered yeah. suicide? And they will market it to these people like your life is kind of worthless and you're sort of a drain on us. And Oh, by the way, um, I'd love to have Christian mention what's going on with Japan and why they're considering these elderly people committing mass suicide in order to take care of a problem. Listen to the problem, which would benefit the government if they did this. So, so first off, before I bring up Japan, I want to, I want to harp on the Canada thing for a second, because it really does. We've talked about the Netherlands briefly. We've talked about Canada. We're about to talk about Japan it really feels like that. That is it me or does it feel like there's a lot of world leaders out there that are just fixated on trying to off their citizens that they're supposed to be representing? Like, That's I, always been the case, Mister History History Buff. It, it, <laughs> I, I've got a 40 second clip from the Canadian Parliament with our boy Pierre here, who literally just a few days ago slammed Trudeau's government for pushing for this legislation to like massively expand this whole assisted suicide program in Canada. It's literally only just the first 40 seconds. Um, so listen to this, and I, I want to get you guys' take on this. After eight years of growing poverty and desperation, more and more Canadians are suffering with depression. Some of them are going to food banks asking for help ending their lives, not because they're sick, but because life has become so miserable and they want to end their lives altogether. This government has suggested veterans should end their lives instead of getting help that they need. And now they've announced that a year from today, they will introduce measures to, to, to end the lives of people who are depressed. Will they recognize that we need to treat depression and give people hope for a better life rather than ending their life? Can you summarize what was just said, Christian? So Pierre points out that in Canada, depression rates have skyrocketed, which is definitely true and absolutely over the past couple of years. Um, there, Canada, similar to the United States, has a depression epidemic right now, um, particularly among younger Canadians. This is something that he brings up, especially with the housing market. There's a lot of people that are my age and younger that feel like they could, they're could they going to be homeless, basically, um, because it's impossible for them to afford housing. And right. um, he has also mentioned that there's um, veterans in Canada. Canada did, for example, like send veteran, um, send, send troops to fight with us in places like Afghanistan and whatnot. So they also have this problem too. Not nearly as much as we do with, you know, we sent a lot more troops overseas than Canada did, but Canada does also have a problem with veteran suicide as well. And so he, he, he has increasingly over the past couple months brought up those issues and said, what's the government's response to the fact that more Canadians than ever before suffer, suffering from depression? They're not giving them hope. They're giving them suicide as an option. It's the responsibility of of the government. It's not really the responsibility of the government to provide hope, but it's the responsibility of the government to provide an environment through which people can be hopeful. Right. Exactly. And, and so so it's it's not that that Pierre's offering some sort of like centrally planned. This is why the government needs to be doing X. No, the government needs to be providing this this free market that he's advocated for in order for people to have a job or to afford a house or to make a living, have something in, in, in life that can give them hope. And instead, Canada's government is doing the exact opposite. And as more and more Canadians feel like that that their lives are miserable and meaningless, the Canadian government, instead of trying to to give people hope, they're 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 trying to kill them. And mm-hmm. I, I think that it's it's just a huge, stunning difference between what I would argue is this vision of life that Pierre is offering and this this cult of death that somebody like Trudeau is pushing. It's a completely opposite worldview. And as you pointed out, Tina, it's not just in Canada. And we've also mentioned the Netherlands. It's also in Japan. We actually did a Y Minute on this recently about the population of Japan falling off a cliff. In fact, so many people are leaving rural Japan to move to Tokyo. Tokyo is the only part of Japan, Tokyo and Osaka, a few other major cities, but really those two are the only places in Japan that are growing. The countryside, the rural parts of Japan are rapidly shrinking because nobody's having any kids anymore. And those that can still move have moved to Tokyo because that's where the jobs are. So the only people left in rural Japan are people in their 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s, in some cases in their 100s. There's, I think, over 50,000 people in Japan that are over 100. Um, And so it's gotten so bad now that I believe the latest statistic is about 13% of all homes in Japan are vacant, abandoned, because 
Japan is wow. rapidly losing population. They're losing a million people a year. And that number is projected to an, uh, increase to about 30% of all homes in Japan being abandoned by the end of the 2030s. And, um, and in fact, there's actually a term to describe abandoned houses. They're called witch houses. Um, and what you're seeing with a lot of these communities are the, these looming ghost towns where everybody's like in their 50s and 60s and 70s. And so the government is having problems providing services to these people because they're out in the middle of the woods and nowhere and they're isolated and all the young people have already skipped town and moved to Tokyo. And they're out of the workforce now. And they're out of the of workforce them. and they're retired and they and a lot of them increasingly can't take for, uh, take care of themselves and they need access to things like healthcare. And there's some elements within the Japanese government and certainly within academia that are like, well, here's the problem. We can just save a bunch of money if we just kill all these people. I, first off... How about you encourage the birth rate to actually reach sustainable levels in Japan so that way you don't have this demographic crisis that will end up destroying the Japanese nation? How about you focus on that rather than focus on how do we kill off all the old people? It, it, it's just incredible that, that the first thought that, that some of these people have is that human life is worthless and, and carries no value. The reason... Well, it's society, well, well, I'll, hang on, Nick, I'll, I'll end with this. The reason that we have been able to pull ourselves out of the gutter as, as a, a species and a civilization over the past two, three hundred years is because we started treating human life like a valuable resource rather than like cannon fodder like we had for thousands of years before. And now we're going back to treating human life like it's worthless which is a very, very dark turn of events, in my opinion. Go ahead, Nick. No, no, I, I think you're right. And I think Tina's point, too, it's like, why does this seem to be especially prevalent in, in countries with socialized medicine? Because socialized medicine certainly wasn't sold to us as this idea that, well, yeah, this will make it easier for us to off people that aren't contributing, right? That was not what it was. Every argument I've ever heard for socialized medicine is this is going to be the only system that effectively and adequately provides for indigent care, right? Those people that cannot provide do not have the means to be able to provide for themselves. And as the systems grow and eventually take over and, and crowd out and cancel out the private systems, what you end up finding out is that all the nice political talk about, oh, look, we're going to take care of everybody uh, doesn't, doesn't work out with respect to resource management. It turns out the government is not good at managing resources. And so they don't create more resources. What they do is they spread around existing resources. They take away the incentives for the resources to be created in the areas where it's needed and desired by people because they've, they've taken people out of the equation. They, they pretend like they haven't, right? They use the argument for people to get the government control of something. And, and some of them, I think, honestly believe that they'll, they'll just do a better job of distributing resources. But because they don't really have a knack for creating or innovating, uh, most of their focus is, is built around this idea of just attempting to more equitably distribute resources in the way that they think it should be distributed. They don't have a lot of they, they don't have a lot of consideration for how this actually affects mindset. So when, when you feel yourself as being responsible for your health, right, that's that can be intimidating. It can be intimidating when you think about having to cover for medical expenses and things like that, or, or having to, you know, make sure that you have insurance or that you 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 stay healthier. But by the same token, you also have some control over what you're doing and you're also cognizant of it. And so you make better decisions for your health when you know you're responsible for it. The moment somebody else becomes responsible for it, right? that, that actually creates perverse incentives. Now, someone's gonna look at that and be like, oh, so you're telling me the four-year-old that gets cancer. No, dumbass, I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you that as a, as a whole on the world, when you tell people you're no longer responsible for something that you are in fact responsible for, whether it be your health or your income or whatever it is, you will create perverse incentives. Over time, what will happen is more and more people will adopt the attitude that I'm not responsible for my health. That's the government's job. They will elect the people that will reinforce this notion and this idea in their head. After, after enough time, when enough people have adopted that sort of mindset, the end result becomes now we don't have the, the resources that we had that were more effectively used, both because we had a market that could actually allow for greater innovation, but also because we had a market where people had some skin in the game, right? You, you've eliminated that. So at the same time that you need more innovation to help more people that you, that you need to help, 
you don't have it. Plus, more people are now entering into that that category that wouldn't have if they felt like they were had some sort of personal responsibility and control over their own health. So over time, what happens? Well, then it becomes very easy for the people that started this system, that want this system, that control the system, to believe that the system is what needs to be protected, not the patients, the system, because the system is the greater good. Okay, well, what ends up becoming a drag on that system? Well, it's the people that can't contribute to the system. Right. It's the people. And then they start creating categories. This is when, when they started, when they were mocking conservatives for talking about death panels under Obamacare. What, what the, and, and death panel was obviously a, a term that was used because it's shocking, but it, it's not an inaccurate description of what we're talking about. Because whenever you're talking about, you know, finite resources and, and essentially, you know, infinite demand, well, then resources have to be allocated. If resources are allocated based off of people making individual decisions, they, they tend to be much more careful about how they make those decisions. If they're just made by some board, some, some government approved body, well, then they're going to start determining, you know what, you don't need that sort of care. Yeah, but I want it and I can pay for it. and It's important to me. Doesn't matter. We've decided you don't need it. And, and, and it, is, it, is not, it is not long to get to a point where people start to decide that, you know what, yeah, we know you want that wheelchair, we know you want that knee surgery, we know it, but based off of where you are in life, we, we want to offer this other option to you because as Tina pointed out and as Christian pointed out, when you see people as a drag on the system, and that is how all government programs work. All right. Your employer sees you as a net benefit, right? Your, your employer actually has far more benefit or, or, or far more incentive to take care of you because you're considered an asset. Government programs will never see people as assets, never, especially ones to where the person does not have to contribute into the system from which they're taking. They, they will, by definition, be considered a liability. And any organization, once it has a crisis of resources, will start to remove liabilities. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not using incendiary language because if we weren't talking about people right now, if we were just talking about something else, we'd all look at this and be like, well, yeah, that's obvious. You know, you want assets, not liabilities. Okay. Well, then you need to start looking. You need to start looking past all the nice political rhetoric justifying these various systems. And you need to start asking yourself, what sort of incentive structure are they creating? Am I an asset within this structure or am I a liability within this structure? And if the answer is you're a liability within that structure, I've got bad news for you. Because at some point, they're going to look to cut you out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a wonderful point. And this is actually a direction that I wanted to go on, uh, go in because I have, for a while now, I've been saying that the way to solve the problem with abortion, because that's my hill to die on, is to rectify the cultural problems that we have. But what I think this most recent conversation we, we've we just had just now has made me realize is that there are knock-on effects to what the government does that affect the culture. And this is in line with what Nick was saying about how when the government is involved with healthcare, people take less responsibility for what they do. And I, if you guys remember Ian from Teamcast IRL, he was constantly talking about how he didn't think universal healthcare was a good idea because we do have so many people who aren't responsible for for their own, their own health. And I happen to agree with that, but I think that that's partly because of what the government has done. Now, I just wanted to ask you guys, then we can start trying to think about wrap this up, wrapping this up a little bit, but what role do you think the government can play in encouraging people not to view suicide as the proper way out and to kind of incentivize people positively? Is them getting out of the picture the only solution or is there a way they can actually make a positive change? I mean, personally, let, let's let's do. There's there's been interesting studies that have come out around the whole concept of suicide hotlines, and and many of these suicide hotlines are um, not all, but but many of them are either uh, indirectly supported by the government through like nonprofit status. Um, some of them are government run, um, and so it, it kind of varies. But they were they were starting to ask themselves: Have these suicide hotlines actually helped? where there's been more advertising and people have become aware of them. And, and there's, I would say there's kind of conflicting data on it, right? You can get into a bad causation versus correlation argument, right? Is it, are there more suicides in the area where the suicide hotlines are because people were just thinking about it and maybe there would have been more had you not done it? Or 
has you know, the, the constant advertising for them and talked about it actually led to greater ideation, suicidal ideation, leading to increased suicides. And in some of these areas, there's been very serious questions asked about whether or not they've had an overall net benefit. And I think part of the problem with government responses to things like this is the government typically responds one of two ways. They create an agency or they give away money. And, and the, the problem I have with both of those is that you're assuming that the best way to deal with a particular problem is to take money from people that have earned it in order to put it into this particular resource. Mm-hmm. And I, I would be more comfortable with that approach if they were ever willing to go back and take a look on whether or not it worked or not, rather than just assuming that it would have been worse had they not done anything. I think the biggest problem, I think one of the problems that we have right now is how people, a, a person whose life is full of purpose and meaning is very, very unlikely to commit suicide. Incredibly unlikely to commit suicide. You, you have a wife, you have a kid, you have a husband, you have a, a job, you have a, a church you go to, you have a community of friends, you have, you have meaning and purpose. You have reasons to get up and to do things in your life. You have friends that you care about and that, and that depend on you. This is another part that's com- an important component of this, depend on you, right? You are far less, less likely um, to commit suicide. You start to remove those things and they get replaced with addiction. Uh, they get replaced with, you know, other activities that might be, um, you know, harmful to you, both mentally and physically. Now you're now you enter the realm of being far more likely because you feel more isolated. Um, the other thing I would say is I, I think that it, it's not <laughs> people. People really do have a have, have a desire to find genuine purpose and meaning. I don't mean just like little purposes, like oh, my purpose is to get up and work a nine to five every day. No, that's depressing, and we're finding out more and more that I, I would think the worldviews and philosophies, and I, I think we're seeing this with women a lot right now, where they've taught women or they've tried to teach women that the most important thing that you will ever do is your career. And, and more and more women have bought into that. And now that we're, we're going back and looking at it, we're finding that, okay, the, the majority of women do not actually agree with that. Um, they, they, there's other things that give them far more meaning and purpose in their life than, than that. But I think this is, a, this is a case of the government trying to come in and say, okay, here's a problem. Now we're going to offer a solution when in reality, a lot of the solutions they offer tend to replace the very things that are necessary to provide meaning and purpose. If I no longer need, if, if you no longer need the man, to get the kids, or you no longer need the man to provide for the kids, or you no longer need the family structure because there's a government program that will pay you, provided that you're not within that family structure, or, or you don't even need the job because there, there's government plans in place in, or, in place in order to assist you with with getting your food and getting your rent, and it, you don't need and you don't need to work either because the government will also pay for your medical benefits. This is something that Theodore Dalrymple talks about in his, in his uh, book. Um, oh gosh, I think it was. Um, uh, the road to the bottom or, or whatnot. It was, it was the mentality that creates uh, the, the bottom class or something like that. I, I wish I could remember the name of the book. It was an excellent book. Life but at he the was bottom. talking about how life at the bottom. Thank you. Life at the bottom. The, it was like the, the mentality that creates the lower class. And what he was saying is that after working for decades within the British National Healthcare Service as a, a psychologist and working within the prison system, what he found was is that the more effort the government took to take out those little things that provide meaning and purpose in one's life, the more depressed people became, the more self-destructive they became, the more they were incentivized to continue to make the same bad decisions because there was either no, uh, the, the adverse consequences were not dire enough to get them to course correct, or there was no, there was no, there was nothing incumbent upon them. They were actually convinced that everything was beyond their control. These things just happened. And one of the ways he described it that I thought was the most meaningful is he wrote an article where he was talking to somebody that had murdered somebody else. And when the murderer was describing what happened, he said, the knife went in. And he found, he found that fascinating. It wasn't, I stabbed that guy. It was the knife went in as if the knife had some sort of consciousness to it. That, that, it, that this was something that was happening to him as opposed to, you know, as the fault of the knife, as opposed to a conscious decision that he was making in the moment to kill another human being. And, and I don't think we fully reconciled ourselves to this notion that as you take more responsibility away from people in the name of providing them with more comfort or affluence or security, you actually take away the very things that give us individual purposes and meaning. Some of them are small, some of them are, are, are big. But that's what I see taking place right now. And, and I don't know that the government's, I, I think the government has contributed to it in an effort to help it because they don't understand the proper mindset. They're looking at people as nothing more 
than than a, a, you know an accident of evolution over over billions of of minor little minor little changes over time in response to stimuli and everything else. They're they're looking at us at a bag of chemistry. And, and I think that's always going to yield to government policies and approaches that misunderstand the problem at a fundamental level and therefore contribute to it rather than alleviate it. Can I add? Yeah, that's a that's a go, go ahead, yeah. Lydia. Um, I love I was just what Nick had to say. say that's there. a great summary. Yeah, I think that's awesome, and I love that we are introducing names like um, Dalrymple. He's fantastic. I hadn't heard anything about him since Jordan Peterson talked with him. Um, and I think that you're entirely correct about this, Nick. Do you have more to add, Christian? Because then I'm going to start. Yeah, first off, I don't think I've ever heard that name, Dalrymple. Theater Dalrymple. Really? Yeah. Nick talked a lot about it on the podcast before we put the team together. Really, I'll have to take a look at him. His, the life his, of the his, actual, his actual name is his actual name is uh, I think Dr. Anthony Daniels. Theodore Dalrymple is his pen name, and he okay. says he picked it because it was like the most ostentatious British <laughs> name. <he could> think <laughs> of. I'll I have to take it. a look at him. But uh, uh, on my end, I'll I'll wrap up with I think that there's something to be said about how this is in some ways the emergence of a new form of eugenics. Um, I I think that that. It reminds me a lot of what happened in the West, including the United States, at the turn of the century in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, in fact, actually, eugenics was very big here in Virginia a century ago. Um, and it was obviously very, very big in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. And there is something to be said about this worldview that treats, as Nick said, treats human beings as just kind of like a bag of meat and bones and chemicals um, rather than as individual human beings with their own consciousnesses and their own you know, hopes and desires and dreams. Those things are real. And there's in increasingly this worldview that treats those things like they're, they're artificial, that, th that they're not actually real. They're all an illusion. And I, I mean that 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 gets into more of the philosophy of it, but it honestly, at some point, we we've got to do an episode at some point where we actually talk about like some of these broader philosophical questions, like and 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 not even j just in terms of like life, but like why are you a conservative? Why do you hold these beliefs? Why do you think life has value? Um, it, like some of these basic questions that I feel like that people on the right have kind of just taken for granted for generations, and rightfully so. But now that they're being questioned in, in, in a serious way, there's a lot of people that don't have any sort of response. There's no response that, that people on the right can can ultimately have to, to something like this. Because as we brought up at the beginning of this podcast, if we say, well, you know, life is precious, why is life precious? Right. Yeah. You know, you know I, I don't think that we should, ha you know, have the state encouraging suicide. Why? Are you against liberty? Right. There, the irony is, is that these same people are going to use the thing that we use to justify all of our other positions on almost everything else in order to, to advocate for this extremely nihilistic worldview that will end up destroying, ultimately, I think, will end up destroying civilization. Like, when Nick gets, gets out of session, we've got to do some, like, philosophically oriented approach to, I've yeah. talked about this before, like, postmodernism, this, this, Deconstruction, nihilism, deconstructionism, yeah. like like critical theory, all of these things that have been feeding into this extremely nihilistic worldview that has, I, I think, in many ways, just completely taken over culture to the point that people are espousing this worldview without even knowing what the worldview is. There's a lot of, po you know, that postmodernism is one, and you know that nihilism is one when there's people out there that espouse postmodernist or nihilist worldviews and arguments without even knowing what those terms are. That's when you yeah. really know you've won the culture, when everybody agrees with you without even knowing what the terminology is, and they don't think there's an alternative out there. They don't think there's another worldview. That's just that's the default point. worldview. So I'll just end with that. Yeah, I think that's a great ending because I think you have a great point there. One of the things that I've really struggled with is that conservatism has such fantastically positive reasoning for people to follow some of their cultural tenets like building a family, going to church, working with your community and making the world generally a better place. But 
for whatever reason, we cannot communicate this to, for example, young people. And I think that what we really need to encourage is people to um, really find the way to make it clear to everyone around them that there really is a reason. There is a very compelling reason to be conservative. And I know Nick had to leave, so I'm going to start to wrap it up here. But I think we need to strongly encourage people to to recognize the powerful positivity of the views that we hold and why. Like there's a reason that we are not nihilistic and why we fight against it tooth and nail because we know it's not true and we are constantly pursuing truth. Like that is really our highest end goal. And when you do that, you are kind of forced to the reckoning that human life actually really is intrinsically valuable and every single person has some form of value, whether you like it and whether you know it or not. So when someone is contemplating suicide, we need to be able to connect with them and kind of give them a compelling reason to carry on. And I think we can summarize this whole conversation by saying something along the lines of combating suicide at any level is going to come down to a cultural change. It has to be a shift. It has to be the ground up. And I know that's not really the answer that people want because it's not a quick solution. It's going to take some time. It's going to take a lot of hard work on, uh, on the parts of everyone involved. Like everyone really needs to understand the role that they play in this. And each individual person has a very important role to fill. And I think that in itself is a, such a fantastic argument against, committing suicide because there is such an important role for you to play in the lives of others. You never know what impact you will have. And I know it's easy to get stuck in a corner and feel like you're trapped and feel like your life has no purpose or meaning. But when it comes down to it, the fact is that you cannot possibly imagine what positive interactions you will have and how much of a difference you could make to someone else. And I think that's probably the single strongest, one of the single strongest cases against suicide as a whole. Now the role that the government plays in that is a totally different kettle of fish, really not something that we should even entertain. It's unfortunate that we're seeing it in Canada and we're kind of being pitched it in Japan. But I think that if conservatives really rise to the occasion on this front, I think that we'll be able to strongly push back all uh, all of these really bad ideas like postmodernism and Marxism and all of this nihilistic stuff they've been cramming down our throats for so long. And I think that this reconnection with our culture, with family, with community, with uh, an understanding of how we need to serve those around us instead of focusing just on ourselves like the left tells us to do, which has given us all this rampant depression and suicidality, I think that we're really going to come out ahead and we can salvage our environment and make sure that the U.S. is in a better place in a few years than it is today, certainly. So I know that's kind of a very philosophical position to end on, but this whole conversation has been super philosophically oriented because you're starting with the concept that human life is valuable and why it's important that we really remind people of that and why we should be pushing back against government policies that encourage suicide because the truth is that like Canada and Japan both have similar, you know, motives for trying to encourage people to commit suicide. That's a really bad place to be. And that's a great argument against big government. So if we leave you with nothing else, hopefully we can use that idea of suicide from the state against the concept of big government and say, hey, if you don't want to be encouraged to commit suicide, definitely don't push the idea of big government because that's ultimately the kind of road it leads on. That's not really a direction we want to go in. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tina, Hamilton, and Christian for joining me too. I'm sorry, Nick had to go. Great conversation. Hopefully we can all dive into like Theodore Dalrymple. Jordan Peterson had a conversation yeah. with him yeah, a couple I'd love years to learn ago. A little bit more about him. Lydia, yeah, there, he there's is a really there, there's mm-hmm. one more thing that I wanted to bring up. You you mentioned at the very end there, by the way, it was a great closer. Um, th- this is kind of like the epilogue here. Um I, I love how you said, you know, I know that it's kind of philosophical. I like you can't do politics um, with without philosophy, so so it's True. it's important. In fact, you can't do much without philosophy. Um, yeah, there's there's one more thing that that you brought up that I I had to touch on where you were like, it seems like that conservatism has all of these you know great ideas, but they're so hard to articulate. Um, it reminded me of this quote by Niels Bohr, 
who um, maybe some people know who he is. He was a um, Nobel Prize winning physicist. He was one of the men that discovered quantum mechanics. And he ended up saying, it's kind of incredible that a hard-nosed scientist would say this. He, he ended up saying, the fact that religions throughout the ages have spoken in images, parables, and paradoxes may sim- uh, mean simply that there may be no other way of grasping the reality to which they refer. But that does not mean that it is not a genuine reality. And I, it just reminded me a little bit on the political side of that, that sometimes we as conservatives have you know, the, the answer to some of these problems. And the answer is not just simply let the state do it. And yet we have a difficulty of explaining it, but the act of, of, of struggling to explain what that solution is or what that reality is to quote board doesn't mean that that explanation or reality is not actually a legitimate one. And so, again, you're jumping into the philosophy there and a lot of people might click off or, or, or zone out because they're, you know, Oh well, you know that that's that's difficult to to address. The you know philosophy of it. A lot of people just find James Madison once said philosophy is just common sense with big words. He wasn't really a big fan of <laughs> of deep thinking like that. And so a lot of people have that James Madison approach to it. I feel like, but it's important to note that just because we might have difficulties explaining some of these concepts, you know, we can take an hour to explain why this is a bad thing, whereas somebody like Trudeau can take five seconds explaining why he wants to legalize suicide. Right. Just to give one example, just because we have a difficulty inherently of explaining our position does not mean that it is not true. And I think that's the heart yes. of what Bohr was trying to get to with this quote there. So I just wanted to leave it with that because you reminded me of it with your with your closing, which, by the way, I loved. It was it was great. Thank you, Christian. I think you're entirely correct as well. And I really value that quote. I'm going to have to look it up for myself. Um, it's true that these truths are simple, but they are not always easy to explain. I would really just encourage our audience to keep trying and keep expanding your mind by reading art, uh, by reading thinkers like Dalrymple and like um, Wilberforce and these other great names and just kind of expanding your view of the world and trying to make sure that we can successfully counter this stuff because it is so important. We really want more people to stick around longer and we want people to understand the intrinsic values of their own lives. So hopefully this gives you guys a little bit of fodder for figuring out how to counter this argument for assisted suicide. And hopefully we won't have to talk too much about it in the future, but I'm not holding my breath on that count. But thank you all for joining us and we will see you all next time.